Hello and welcome to another episode of Autogar Fuel. Today with me, AJ and Jonas. Even though Cupra has spun off as its own brand a little while ago, they were still only making fast versions of Seat cars. Well, not any longer. Meet the Cupra Formentor, Cupra's first bespoke model. Let's take a closer look. As you can imagine, the Formentor is on VW's MQB Evo architecture. So that is the same architecture and platform that underpins the Golf 8, the new Octavia, the Audi A3, and of course the Seat Leon. But like the Leon and the Octavia, the Formentor is on the slightly longer wheelbase version of this platform as compared to the wheelbases on the Golf and the Audi A3. Up front as well, this is very, very similar to the Leon, but there are a few small differences. For example, these vertical slats that you see here, as well as the fog lamps, which are really right below the front headlamp unit. Speaking of the headlamps, you do get LEDs as standard. However, you do not get even the option of matrix LEDs. Those are only reserved for the higher end of the VW portfolio. But I do like the this aggressive front design. It's very different. I, I think Cupra is one of those brands which are not uh, afraid to you know, try new things. And I like that copper tribal art. It's like an alien logo, like a transformer or like one of those evil villainous alien characters from some movie or video game. I don't know, it just kind of reminds me of that with the carbon fiber kind of background. Um, a very large open grille with this nice structure. A lot of glossy black elements. You get different paint options including a very nice red and some blues but there's also a couple matte colors like this is a matte finish as you can hear kind of goes well with this kind of stealthy dark theme but the lower parts of the body so the body kit for example the lower part of the bumper and as we'll see later on the wheel arches and the side skirts are a little bit glossy or metallic finished plastic um, well actually this is kind of good because it's easier to polish the small scratches and buff them out on these kinds of elements rather than on matte finish um, uh, materials so also Radar sensor in the front. There's a lot of new technology as well on offer for the new Formentor. Um, but overall, what do you guys think of this design? Do you like it? Is it too similar to the Leon or do you think it really has its own character? The Formentor is 4.45 meters long, it's 1.83 meters wide, and it weighs about 1,644 kilograms. That is in this 310 2 liter petrol engine version. I'll talk more about the different engine options and powertrain options later on. Um, but like I was telling you guys earlier, this is a little bit of the longer wheelbase version, so you can expect a little bit more legroom in the back seat. Is that true? We'll take a look in a minute. Up front, first of all, you have McPherson strut independent front suspension, as expected, and you have multi-link rear axle as well. You have a very large ventilated and drilled brake rotor with this really huge uh, copper-colored Brembo brake caliper. I like this color. Uh, it's got these copper accents. You can get some different de uh, wheel designs, including a very aero design, which makes sense uh, for the, for the uh, plug-in hybrid versions. But uh, this is 19 inches, has that tribal art logo right in the middle. As we go along the side, you see that we have wheel arches uh, clad with the metallic finish plastic that we saw in the bumper, as well as down here near the side skirt. So overall, now this brings me to the next discussion point, and I need your help over here. What would you classify the Formentor as? Is this a crossover coupe, just a crossover, or would you even dare call it an SUV? In my eyes, this is a crossover. I wouldn't call it a crossover coupe. 
because in reality this is very similar um, in its silhouette to a little bit of a raised Seat Leon or a Cupra Leon and in that way it doesn't have the the butch squarish stance that the Ateca has which is more SUV even though it's a crossover SUV so in my eyes this is just a regular crossover and it kind of works in its favor it's it's in a very niche little segment you know a hot crossover we have the very classic Seat inspired uh, design lines so we have one thick crease going from the front fender and disappearing in the middle of the rear door and another crease coming in from the back although in this uh, in the Formentor this rear crease is a lot more pronounced it starts at a higher level here so it gives a very athletic strong shoulder line I do like this the roof also slopes gradually so it is not as uh, uh, as sharply sloped as a standard coupe would have you gloss black along the window frame and yeah this matte color really helps you know play with that effect of light and shadow to create more depth and overall it's a very I think a very striking side silhouette coming to the back well first of all you do see that sloping roof line a little bit more prominently over here and although it looks good of course you're going to be losing out a little bit of trunk volume because of this uh, shape as well as the window is not that large even though it might be sloping and along this way the vertical uh, area that you're going to be able to see out of uh, is going to be quite limited but I do like this spoiler at the top as well as this long horizontal tail lamp which extends all the way across LED with cascading turn indicator lights more Cupra badging down here and as we go further down well hurrah we have dual exhaust with like a dual port on each side actually and this is uh, for the 310 horsepower engine if you have the plug-in hybrid version like we saw on the Seat uh, sorry the Leon Cupra you will have fake exhaust tips but you do have a nice glossy black rear diffuser as well and yeah overall a very sexy backside there you can see the cascading turn indicators in action and while we're at it take a listen to this all right let's take a look under the hood first of all the hood itself is a bit heavy and you don't have gas charged struts you gotta do it the old-fashioned way nevertheless right here we have the ubiquitous 2 liter TSI the EA888 family of engines which in this case makes 310 horsepower and when I say ubiquitous this truly is ubiquitous we see this engine in the Golf uh, GTI in the Octavia in the Leon in Audis even Porsche Macans have this engine so it's a tried and tested very strong engine they even use this in their TCR uh, race cars as well well the block in essence but you will have more options later on right now this is the only one you will find on the configurator there will even be uh, also a familiar plug-in hybrid that we see uh, from the GTE for example which is a 1.4 liter turbo 4 petrol engine with an electric motor and a 13 kilowatt hour battery good for about 245 PS or metric horsepower there will also be the 2 liter TDI so you will get a diesel Cupra uh, with 150 horsepower the 1.5 TSI with 150 horsepower as well that's the turbo petrol um, but here in this we have the 310 this is the big daddy the flagship 310 horsepower made it to the 7-speed DSG that's the direct shift gearbox it's a double clutch shift by wire system it's primarily front wheel drive oriented but as we know uh, from again this platform it has the Haldex or BorgWarner rather uh, coupling based on-demand all-wheel drive system now this is the older version it's not the new one that we see in the Golf R which has twin clutch packs to divert and oversteer the uh, the rear axle but here it's the the older version but uh, still provides a good um, torque distribution 50 50 and it also has a brake based torque vectoring or a locking differential of sorts We're using the brakes and uh, with the newer engines that will come out you will even get manual transmission but here it's only the DSG it's good for about 250 kilometers per hour that's the VMAX and a 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.9 seconds
here we have the key fob with the Cupra logo. This might look like capacitive buttons, but thankfully they are real buttons below this. This is just like a silicone cover. Nevertheless, keyless entry. Put your key in your pocket, touch the door handle and it opens. Let's give it a quick sound check. I would say pretty solid. I didn't hear anything rattle. The rear door didn't shimmy. So pretty good build quality that we can expect from VW Group. Talking about materials on the door, the top is soft touch. We have a nice inlay, gray colored over here. Soft touch materials down here. Familiar switch gear. By the way, this is for the electronically adjustable outside rear view mirrors, which in the beginning, you might find they're a bit narrow and slim. It's just a matter of getting used to them. Just thought I'd let you know. Um, also LED lighting along the top here for the ambient lights. Some pr pretty cool functions that we'll I'll tell you a little bit more about later on. Generous door pockets, nice texture along the bottom. By the way, you can get the audio system with the optional Beats audio, which we tested and it sounds pretty good. It's not the best system in this, uh, in this segment, but if you're somebody who enjoys good music, I would recommend that you do opt for that. Now let's take a look inside and take a look at the seats that we have. So you have different uh, black leather and petrol blue leather options, but also you get a textile option as well, which we would always recommend. You know, you can make that little bit of sacrifice and just be a little bit kinder to the environment. These are electronically adjustable for up and down on the base and the reclining of the back rest, as well as with lumbar support. Being the sports seat, you also have pretty good side bolstering. So let me hop inside and tell you a little bit more. So first of all, ingress is not as tall as you would expect. Rather, while there is decent amount of space to get inside, it doesn't have like that Seat Ateca or Skoda Kodiak or Tiguan kind of really tall SUV body like we talked about. So it's a little bit in between at the end of the day. Sitting inside, oh, <laughs> like I said when I sat in the in the Leon Cupra, it's so different. I love these copper accents. I know it's not to everybody's taste, but it's just so different and cool. You also have LED lighting all along the top. There's almost like this gorge or this canyon that envelops the front of the cockpit. Again, it feels like I'm driving or piloting some kind of alien spaceship. And Jonas, if you can look all along, you know, the the LED lighting also connects with the front, so it's pretty cool. I also like the way these air conditioning vents, you know, the design is very similar to the front grille. And the haunches on the hood, on the hood I can see, because I, I put the seat all the way down, which is what I always prefer when I'm driving um, a sporty car, and I can see the haunches, and it's easy to see where the edges of the front are. I have plenty of headroom if I put the seat all the way down. I mean, this is this is cavernous, really. You do get um, the panoramic roof where that would eat up a little bit more space, but in this car, um, there isn't so plenty of room. But yes, I love the steering wheel. It's very interesting. So why don't you hop inside and we'll take a look at these systems. All right, let's take a look at the interior. First thing that grabs your attention is this new 12 inch infotainment system, as well as the 10.25 inch digital cockpit. This being the shift by wire DSG, of course, on the steering wheel, we do have the paddle shifters. And as you can see, a lot of buttons to control the digital cockpit, a lot of buttons here also to control the assistance systems. The drive mode selector is directly on the steering wheel, which is pretty nice and as well as the engine start-stop button. So a little bit Lamborghini-esque, or rather Ferrari-esque, excuse me, because I remember they also have a lot of buttons, including the engine start-stop on the steering wheel. Now, let's start with the digital cockpit because there's a lot of different settings and views. First of all, in this view, you can toggle between different settings or different uh, visualizations, like for example, a map, um, the road signs, driving data, and so on, or you can change the view entirely. You can have a more digital, um, squircle shaped tack and speedo. You can have just like the assistance systems if you don't want to have any of those. You can have a more map oriented view. 
a very minimal view. There's so many in all of these. You have so many different customizations. I mean, the list is endless. And this is where I start having a little bit of a problem. I mean, like, for example, on this view, you can have so many different settings, a G meter. On this side, you can change it to something else. Is it too much? At one point, I think it becomes a bit too much. And the reason why I say too much is not that it's not nice to have these options. It's just it's too many things to fiddle with when you're trying to drive the car and everything is operated and nested away in a bunch of menus and that's where you are going to be distracted you're not going to be paying attention you have to you know cycle through these different menus find what you need and then try to change it to what you want and <laughs> it's all i'm just getting i'm just getting annoyed just talking about it so I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, even the S class is now just all touch interface and you can see there's no buttons anywhere. And I don't really like that. I think it's very important to have buttons. Not only is it easy to touch and, you know, feel what you're pressing and how much you're doing it, but if you have like toggle switches or, you know, you can just touch that and you can know if it's on or off or which position it is in. You, everything here is nested away in a bunch of menus. And again, there's so much customization you can have like different tiles on the front home page, which I guess is useful because you're utilizing a lot of this real estate with maybe you have your map, your music and your phone. Like for example, that's what is on this by default. But again, for the air conditioning, you have to go into a separate menu. You have to choose how much of auto you want. You want level one auto, level two or level three. I mean, I think it's a bit too much. And then two climate zones in the front, one in the back that you can control. There's a lot of settings that you have to go through. If you want to turn on your seat heater, you have to go to this menu, select the seat heating. There should just be buttons for at least the air conditioning and the volume. Speaking of the volume, you have to slide your finger across this system. And honestly, I found this... Jonas and I, we were trying to connect our phone. We were trying to turn the volume up and down. It's not intuitive. And you can tap, of course, but I really wish there was a knob for this. So... Even the temperature here as well is controlled by the slider or you can tap. But anyway, if you go to the home menu, this also looks very much like an iPhone with all of these little tiles or these like, they look like pieces of candy. And yes, you have multiple different settings. Um, you also have the vehicle menu here and we can take a look at the parking, sorry, the uh, driver assistance system. So you have parking assist where it will analyze the space uh, if it's big enough for the car and steer the car for you. You have traction control, hill descent control, lane keeping assist with steering intervention. You have adaptive cruise control, um, which of course also gives you uh, the, um, yeah, also things like the dynamic uh, road sign display. You can even set that to a system where it will automatically adjust the speed of your cruise control depending on the speed limit. Eco assist, which is pretty interesting. And again, we've seen this before. It's a bit like, for example, if it sees in the navigation that you're coming to a roundabout, then it will tell you to take your foot off the throttle pedal so that you can just coast towards the junction and not have to use the brakes and therefore waste your kinetic energy. Side assist, front assist, driver alert system, emergency assist, exit warning system. So a bunch of uh, security systems and we'll take a look at that later on. Of course, when you're talking about a Cupra, you need to talk about sports, um, sports driving profiles. So you have comfort. So this comes with the dynamic chassis control, which is an adaptive electric electronic damping system for the shock absorbers. And uh, we'll see how comfortable the comfort mode is, but you also have a sport. Then you have the Cupra, which is the out and out. I would say the equivalent of a track mode. You have an off-road mode because this is, of course, four-wheel drive. And you have an individual mode, which it's always nice because now we can look at all the different parameters you can set. So the DCC has 15-way adjustment, which is, I think, too many ways of adjustment, <laughs> if you ask me, for the how you want the program to be, how you want the all-wheel drive to be engaged, how much steering weight you want. You also have progressive steering, and we'll talk a lot more about that later on because I always like progressive steering. It's nothing new. We've seen it, especially in this um, MQB platform, for a long time now. Engine, of course, totally changes the way the throttle response behaves, how the um, gearbox shifts up, and it's a, it makes a huge difference. 
you also have the sound actor to amplify the sound on the inside and yes yeah, so you can set these parameters individually but um, yeah ultimately yes it's nice to have everything connected Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, Mirror Link, all of these things are nice but somehow it's a bit too fiddly to use and please Cupra bring back the buttons I also like this material here and this contour almost like a little shelf damped glove box which is pretty big inductive phone charger two USB-C ports and of course we come to the shift by wire DSG really small little switch again we've seen this before um, traction control park button parking brake electronic parking brake door lock a couple cup holders which don't have any kind of adjustable or uh, spring-loaded clamps but they're pretty deep an armrest which you can slide forward and back also plush and soft which also has a ratchet based you know height adjustment and if we take a look inside a little bit more space and a 12 volt charging port all right let's take a look in the back seat so as we can expect unfortunately the top part of the door is hard plastic but still at least the build quality is pretty good because for example an easy way to test this is put on a song with a lot of bass, turn the bass in the EQ all the way up and turn the volume all the way up and see how much your door panels start buzzing. And we tried this. This is a simple test you can do in your car and it did not buzz. So it's hard, but it's built pretty well. But you do have some plush materials over here. Door pockets down there as well. Let's hop inside. So first of all, you see how large the opening is. It's a very, uh, very, wide opening again thanks to the slightly longer wheelbase that the Formentor has as compared to the Golf. Um, getting in is really easy. You have two isofix points on either of the outside two rear seats. You also have isofix points on the front passenger seat. So with this large opening it's easy to get your child seats in. Again because of the slightly sleeker roof line as compared to the Ateca it's you have to bend a little bit so you don't expect this to be the most SUV-like ingress. But that being said, plenty of knee room. This seat is set to my driving position. I'm five foot eight or about 1.73 uh, meters. Headroom is ample. I also have a little three-quarter window right over here, so there's plenty of light. If you do get the optional panoramic roof, the light, uh, the light becomes even more. You do lose a little bit of headspace along this Kind of like towards the outer edge of course as you can imagine but it shouldn't be too bad i would always prefer a panoramic sunroof there is an additional third climate zone over here and a couple other usb-c ports a very prominent albeit narrow albeit tall transmission tunnel because of course this is also the four-wheel drive so this is uh, you know required isofix points which are kind of hidden away behind these little flaps. The materials on the seat are pretty nice. Let's check the middle seat out. So the bottom cushion is pretty good. The backrest is a little bit firm because it also has that plastic cup holder, that entire uh, little piece over there. So it's a little bit firm, but it's fairly flat. And if you're not gonna fight with your co-passengers, you could have three adults sitting here in the back seat. Nevertheless, you also have a center armrest with the cup holders, a ski hatch, and you can also, there we go, <laughs> you can also fold the rear seats down directly from here as well. Automatic tailgate comes in handy when your hands are full. We're looking at 420 liters of boot space in this 310 2 liter petrol only variant. You can expect a little bit less space when you have the hybrid, but it is a fairly rectangular space. The wheel arches don't impede too much, and even where they do, you have been given these really nice little wells where you can kind of secure away smaller items so they don't uh, roll around. You also have a 230 volt power outlet so you can charge or power. I don't know, maybe a compressor or some other uh, ancillary equipment. The floor also, uh, if you open it up, in this case we have an additional equipment for the audio system, but um, there's a little bit more room down there. 
you can fold the seats down with these two tabs and they do fall on their own all the way flat as you can see so it's really nice and really usable just to give you an idea here is my standard issue airline, uh, sorry, airline cabin baggage and it fits in very easily I could also fit this in vertically if I wanted to some tether points as well so again being this crossover you don't get too much space vertically because of this sloping roofline you can see what really is the usable space it, it ends you know right about here and if you want everything to fit below the parcel shelf it has to fit below this line over here you can remove the parcel shelf very easily with just removing these ties and just a quick pop and then it comes out as such All right, let's take the Cupra Formentor out for a spin. We found some gorgeous winding country roads, so I'm just gonna get onto that road and then let's test it. But first impressions, and I have to share this, is that this tech is a bit too much. It gets a bit overwhelming. Like, even though I've driven several different cars um, on the show, you know, this is one of the few cars where I sat in and it took me more time and it was, I started to get <laughs> frustrated with it quite quickly there's so many settings there's a plethora of uh, options and it's just yeah i'm not i'm not completely sold on this new user interface but anyway we're driving the 310 horsepower um, two liter turbo petrol for mentor so there's really one thing that i really have to start with and that's the performance so as we get out of this little village press and hold the Cupra button to directly go into Cupra mode, drop it into sport, and then put my foot down. Wow. So the acceleration is very good, but you don't get that instant shove in the back like, you know, with like a, like a plug-in hybrid or an electric car would give you because it still is a little bit old fashioned in the way that it's a, a petrol engine, but still that four wheel drive system ensures there's plenty of grip and traction as you launch out in a straight line. Zero to 104.9 seconds. Remember that. That's a pretty good number. Also, this has electronic brake-based torque vectoring. So this prevents and controls any kind of torque steer um, or any kind of slip or understeer. And again, the progressive steering just works so well I mean this is not a new technology it's been around for quite some time so it really gives you exactly the the amount of feedback as well as it makes it seem so much more agile this entire car so what is a progressive steering really quick if you haven't uh, if you're not aware of this so usually in a regular steering it's more linear so if you draw a graph of the amount of steering input you're providing versus the the, the deflection of the angle of the steering of the wheels itself it's usually a straight line but in a progressive steering rack it increases so the rate of change increases with the more input you provide and what that means is around the center around dead center the steering is a lot slower um, I mean overall it's a faster rack but it's, it's it's slower so it gives you that finesse that minute control that you need for 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 winding roads like this but as you get towards you know like like let's say three o'clock or, or 2 30 then the rate of uh, the rate of steering increases so you never have to leave your hands from this position and no matter what kind of a steering uh, sorry what kind of a bend you're approaching you can do almost all of them um, by just never having to shuffle your hand so this really makes it feel really sporty the paddle shifters are nice and tall they are mounted on the steering wheel and not on the steering column. So that means you're always ready to shift up or down. The seven speed shift by wire, DSG, the direct shift, dual clutch transmission is razor sharp, very instant. The pedal weight is also really good. So the throttle pedal also has a good weight. The brakes are also really well weighted and it gives you so much confidence, those big Brembo calipers and that big ventilated and drilled uh, rotors 
are very reassuring. I'm going to turn around and head back on that same road just, just to get that uh, coming back the other side. And this time we'll leave it in, in sport mode in terms of uh, the gearbox, so I'll let it do its own thing. So the engine also sounds a lot nicer on the inside thanks to that sound actor. But of course the exhaust note on the outside is also really nice. You hear that turbo whine. It is a very engaging car to drive. This DCC also works really well. So in the Cupra mode, it's not just, you know, an on-off binary kind of damping, or it's not set damping rates. It's actually a dynamic rate. It's an adaptive rate. So it always changes. You know, if you're going into this corner now, this wheel gets a little bit stiffer. These wheels slacken off a little bit to also aid that anti-roll. So it's a continuously variable damping rate. And the program of how it gets uh, changed is dependent on the driving profile that you select. So overall, it really feels like a car. It really feels like the Leon Cupra. It feels like, you know, the Golf R. It feels very much like an MQB Evo hot hatch. And you forget that you're in a hot crossover. Throttle response is great. Again, it's fast. 310 horsepower sounds like a lot, or sounds like a healthy amount, and it is. But let's not forget that this still weighs about 1,600 kilograms, and this is not... Oh, wow, this road. And this is not a plug-in hybrid. So it does have a little bit of lag where it, it needs to shift down, the turbos have to spool up. But I know this engine, this is the ubiquitous engine that we see in so many of VW Group cars. So I know this engine quite well. So nothing too, nothing too different here. But yeah, we will see how the plug-in hybrid versions that they come out with, you know, if that makes, if that makes acceleration even better. Because while 0 to 100 is a great number, 4.9 is pretty healthy, what really is fun and what you really feel is also the zero to 50 kilometers per hour, half that, because that's when you can jump in traffic or that's when that instant push from an electric motor, that instant torque really makes a big difference. So, all that said and done, the Formentor is very agile, it's very fun, engine sounds good, steering is really nice, the chassis control is fantastic, the engagement that it provides with the with the, the weight of the control interfaces, the steering wheel, the, the throttle pedal, the brake pedal. So I think in terms of driving dynamics and driver engagement, it's got all the boxes covered. 310 horsepower is a healthy amount. You're going to have fun with it. It might not be, I'm going to break your neck fast, but it's definitely, I'm going to push you back in your seat fast. Now we're in a village, so let's turn off into one of the other modes. So let's go to comfort mode. So in this mode, instantly, the sound decreases on the inside, the steering wheel becomes a lot lighter. Um, the car also helps with maintaining better economy. So if I let go of the throttle, this DSG now starts coasting. And when you th step on the throttle, the way it re-engages is very easy. And even in, the, even in little villages like this, this um, progressive steering rack is really nice because it, you know, it means that of course, when you're making right angle turns, you have to shuffle your hands. But otherwise, if you want to make quick corrections and you know avoid some obstacles or potholes or turn into lanes and such like that, and, and, and you know things like that, it's also very easy. And it, progressive steering racks are just awesome, <laughs> if you ask me. The seats are also fairly comfortable. You have a lot of adjustment. Of course, you have different choices. You don't necessarily have to use, you don't necessarily have to get these uh, leather seats. You can get um, the, the textile seats as well. There's plenty of side bolstering and different uh, you know, parameters you can set and adjustability to set this correct position that you want, the way you want it. And the dimensions of this car are also, you know, very usable. Like I just passed this tractor on this narrow country lane and 1.8 meters is not too wide. So I think it's a great compromise for the city as well. It's a very useful car as your only car, as your daily runabout. In this mode, it's peaceful and calm.
So we saw that the Cooper Fermenter shines when you want to drive spiritedly. It also becomes comfortable, it simmers down when you want to use it as a daily driver to commute to office. But what about when you want to go on a long highway stint on a road trip with your family? Well, let's test that out too. So I'm just joining the Autobahn now. Let's accelerate up to motorway speeds. So right now I can hear the engine quite a bit and at 130 as well there is a little bit of wind noise. It's not too bad and actually the tire noise is also really well controlled so I don't hear too much of the tire noise even though this has slightly bigger wheels and it has the sports tires. I can hear a little bit of wind but it's, uh, it's not too bad so overall sound insulation on the highway is pretty good. Also in the normal mode, the suspension with the DCC is really comfortable, so I don't feel any undulations, I don't feel any of the sharpness filtering in, I didn't feel that in the city either, so it really is a very good system which balances uh, stiffness for sporty handling as well as softness for comfortable driving. There's also a lot of assistance systems, so I can turn on for example the travel assist, and now this of course combines the adaptive cruise control with the lane keeping assist but it also has traffic sign recognition and it adapts to that. So right now it sees that this, uh, the speed has become 80 kilometers per hour, so it will automatically slow down to 80 kilometers per hour. It will maintain the distance that I set, a safe distance with the car in front, and also maintain uh, me in the middle of the lane. And the system works quite well. So this is a much more upgraded uh, or a better version of this technology uh, this kind of technology has come a long way in the last few years and it's good to see uh, systems like this continuously improving, they're becoming smarter, it's harder to confuse them, so it gives you that assurance that when you're on the highway with your family um, you are going to be quite safe. But yeah, when you're not really pushing the car too hard, when you're not really crossing 100, it is very quiet in here. Um, the seats are also, for longer distances, fairly comfortable. So while they are sporty seats, uh, they're not like the sporty seats that you get in some other manufacturers like BMW seats. Their sport seats are a little bit too firm for my taste, whereas these are still plush and soft enough to, you know, not start hurting you, but supportive enough to make sure that you don't start aching. The four-wheel drive system also gives you confidence at higher speeds. Although this is not the new rear axle unit like the Golf R has with the clutch packs on either side to vector the torque, this is still the older Haldex based system, um, it still gives you plenty of confidence to go at higher speeds, like right now at 160. The lane keeping assist is still working at this speed, I don't feel any torque steer, I feel a lot more, I hear more of the wind, but the steering is also really heavy and that weight gives me the confidence. Progressive steering rack also means that um, because at dead center the, the, I, can, I have more control and modulation because it's not so quick in the middle, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't upset the car when I want to change lanes or make small changes, it's not, it's not darty. Visibility is also pretty good now on the highway, I have that high seating position helps me see further out into the road. And uh, already I can tell you that the mileage is uh, getting much better. Now I'm at around 9.3 liters for 100 kilometers. So again, if you don't go too fast um, and you drive on the highway more in the comfort mode, it's going to give you numbers around 8.5. This, uh, this transmission and this, these different driving profiles will monitor and manage different things. Even the air conditioning, if you have it in uh, you know, normal mode, can be a little bit more economical so you can expect numbers around 8.5. But yeah, I am, I'm actually quite happy with this car. I like that it's, it's youthful, I like that it's different, and I like the little other you know, changes, like for example, these uh, blind spot monitoring, um, uh, the indicator, the, the notification lights are on the inside, in part of the interior, and not on the outside rear view mirrors like the other cars. So again, it's just that they do things a little bit differently, the design, the copper accents, it's youthful, it's playful, it's kind of, you know, alien-like, but um, it has its own character. And for somebody who has a 
personality. This car will match that and will um, uh, you know, exemplify that. And um, yeah, seems to be a jack of all trades. Well, the price of the Formentor for the 310 version starts at around 44,000 euros. But if you add a couple options like the panoramic sunroof, um, you can reach numbers around 50,000 euros. But let's not forget, there's going to be the 150 horsepower TDI and TGI, or rather the TSI, with front wheel drive and manual transmission. And we can hope for them to be a little bit more cheaper. So what did I like about the Formentor and what did I not like about the Formentor? For starters, I like its personality, I like its demeanor, I like the way it looks and I really love the way it drives. It truly has the best of having that crossover, uh, practicality with a little bit more space, a little bit more upright seating position, but at the same time it's low enough and sleek enough to drive and behave like a car. What I didn't like so much is the infotainment and the technology and all the gizmos and gadgets inside. It's a little bit confusing to operate. It can get frustrating, but you're just gonna have to learn to live with it, I suppose. But let me know what your opinion is. And by the way, towards the end of the drive, I did manage numbers around nine liters for 100 kilometers, but that's because I was driving with a heavier foot. And honestly, if mileage is what you're after, wait for the front wheel drive diesel engines to come out, and then you can expect much better efficiency. But if you're out for performance, I think 9 liters, maybe 8.5 if you're driving with a gentle right foot, is I think a respectable number for a hot crossover such as this. So overall, I think it's a very interesting proposition. Let me know what you think, put it down in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.